Uh, we're honored to once again have Jerry Dunifer here leading a journey with Jerry Talk. He's been doing these, I think, since last May. Um, and all of the previous talks are available on our website and hope to continue doing them. But tonight, we're really excited for penguins, one of my favorite topics. Um, so just in case, if you don't know Jerry yet, uh, he's Jerry Dunifer, PhD. He's a professor emeritus at Wayne State. He was a member of the faculty in the Department of Physics and Astronomy for 35 years before retirement. Since he retired, one of his favorite hobbies has been visiting a number of the significant and historic astronomy observatories around the world. He's visited dozens of such sites, traveling as the graphic South Pole and the North Pole and many places in between. Um, so tonight, if you, if you have any questions for Jerry throughout the presentation, um, we would ask everyone, please stay muted um, until the end, but there will be a question and answer portion uh, with like the final 15 minutes or so. So if you have any questions at any time, feel free to just click the chat box at the bottom, type the question in, and I will make sure that your questions are asked during the question and answer portion. Um, also be on the lookout, uh, our director of our planetarium, Megan McCullen, she's going to put in some links to some upcoming planetarium shows. Uh, the, uh, they're all remote planetarium shows you can watch from home while we're waiting to get back to our planetarium in the uh, basement of Old Main. So um, now I'm going to let uh, it away. <clears throat> well, good evening, uh, fellow travelers. And thank you, Steve, for the introduction. Uh, just before I get started, let me uh, tip my camera over a little bit so you can see my t-shirt. Uh, this I bought uh, at the southernmost, southernmost souvenir shop in the world, which we're going to be visiting tonight. Picture a nice little penguin on the front. So I think my screen is up. So this evening, we're going to be going down to the Antarctic Peninsula. On my uh, third presentation in this series, uh, we went to the Galapagos Islands down on the equator. And we were in the, we were on a boat, we were on the ship, uh, the National Geographic Endeavor. And there were quite a few uh, passengers, um, visitors, and uh, I talked to a number of them. And one question I asked them, was uh, where is the most interesting place that you have traveled? There are a lot of big world travelers there. What was the most interesting, the most scenic, the most spectacular? What would you recommend most to a person like me? And to my surprise, I got the same answer from quite a few people. They said Antarctica, they found the most interesting. And what they were referring to was the Antarctic Peninsula, which one can visit uh, by ship or boat. So that's where we're going this evening. And we're going to see lots of penguins. And they come in a variety and huge numbers down there. So this is an example of a few types of penguins which we will be seeing on this trip. So this is the continent of Antarctica. And in my very first presentation, we went down to the South Pole and we visited the, the Amundsen-Scott uh, Research Base, uh, NSF Base, National Science Foundation Base. Uh, we got there by air. So we had first of all flown into our base camp, which is on Union Glacier located approximately here, quite close to Mount Vinson, the highest mountain in Antarctica. And from there, we flew up to the South Pole and spent uh, 24 hours or so and then flew back. So today, we're not going to uh, be going to that part of Antarctica. <clears throat> we're going to be visiting the Antarctic Peninsula, which is this region here. And in particular, the northern part of the Antarctic Peninsula, including the South Shetland Islands over here. And we're going to make a short trip into uh, the Weddell Sea in this vicinity, looking for large icebergs, because they break off of the ice 
shelf, like a Larson ice shelf or the Rhone Filchner ice shelf. But we're going to be see if we can find any because some of them are giant, miles in size. So the way we got there is we started in Detroit. We flew down to Miami. And then we took an overnight flight down to Buenos Aires, which is located about here, and then changed planes. And then from there, flew down uh, towards the tip of South, South America down here. So in a little more detail, this is Argentina. Here's uh, Buenos Aires. And flying from Buenos Aires down to Ushuaia, which is where we're going, uh, Ushuaia is the southernmost city in the world. Uh, we're going to fly pretty much in a straight line, which takes us over land for close to an hour. And then most of the flight is over open water. And just before landing, we're going to come in over land again before we land at Ushuaia. So Argentina is indicated here uh, in color. And uh, Ushuaia is the capital of Tierra del Fuego which is this little island right here. And it shouldn't say little, pretty good sized island. It's shared between Argentina and Chile. So in a little more detail, this is Tierra del Fuego. And this is Ushuaia, which is located right here. That's uh, where we're gonna be flying into to pick up our ship that will take us down to Antarctica. It's located on the Beagle Channel, which you see right here. This was named after the HMS Beagle, uh, which is a ship that Charles Darwin was on when he went around the world, gathering data, which he used later incorporated into his theory of evolution. If you want to go around uh, the southern tip of South America, taking you from the Atlantic Ocean over to the Pacific Ocean, uh, there are three ways of doing it. You can go through the uh, Magellan Strait which is this way, which is the route that Magellan took. You can uh, take the Beagle Channel, like so, or you can go around um, Cape Horn, uh, the very tip right lo located here, uh, down to this water here, which is uh, very infamous and very treacherous. You tend to have high winds, high waves, can be an exciting, even a deadly area to sail in. So um, once we go to Ushuaia land here, we're very close to the Tierra del Fuego National Park, Tierra del Fuego Land of Fire. And we're gonna go down and play, pay a quick visit there. It's only seven miles away from Ushuaia. Um, you can also point out up here, Punta Arenas, when we flew to the South Pole, uh, we stopped in Punta Arenas for a few days ahead of time to get our uh, gear to uh, insulate ourselves from the cold temperatures. And so now we're quite a bit further south, uh, about 113 miles further south than Punta Arenas. Now, Ushuaia is often called the most southern city in the world, but to be technically correct, there's another little town down here in Chile, uh, Port Williams, but often that's not counted because it only has a population of about 3,000. And to some people, that's not a city. Ushuaia has 57,000 uh, population. Also point out Route 3, which you see coming down this way. This is the Pan American Highway that will take you from the tip of South America up to Alaska. And uh, it ends right at this point and we'll be at the end of the Pan American Highway. So the route we're gonna be taking uh, is indicated here, although ignore these red lines and arrows because that, that was for another trip. We're going from Ushuaia down the Beagle Channel and then south. Over here, we're going into the Weddell Sea a little ways looking for big icebergs. And then we're coming back and we're heading south this way coming within about 80 miles of the Antarctic Circle, which you see indicated here as the dash line. And we're gonna turn around, go north. And on our way back, we're gonna stop at Deception Island, 
before we head back uh, towards South America. So on this trip, uh, Detroit to Miami was about uh, 1,150 miles. Miami to Buenos Aires, uh, 4,410 miles. Buenos Aires to Ushuaia, 1,470 miles. And then by boat, Ushuaia to the Antarctic Peninsula, about another 700 miles. Total distance, 7,730 miles. That's almost one third of the way around the Earth. Uh, between South America and the Antarctic Peninsula, we're going to be going across the Drake Passage, which as I mentioned earlier, can have very rough seas. And I was looking forward to this. I, I'm a sailor, I like uh, sailing and uh, I've never been seasick. So I thought it'd be interesting to see some really big waves. I was very disappointed. It was one of the smoothest crossings they ever had. Antarctic Peninsula, we're going from 62 degrees south down to 65.3 degrees south, and that's taking us within about 80 miles of the Antarctic Circle, never quite getting below that. A uh, short visit into the Weddell Sea looking for big icebergs. Those of you who are familiar with uh, Ernest Shackleton's expedition back in the early 1900s, expedition which ended in tragedy when his uh, ship, the Endurance, I think, was trapped in the ice and then crushed. And then over a year was spent rescuing his men from that situation. We'll be in the northern part of the Weddell Sea. Uh, we'll be visiting two scientific research stations, one owned by the US uh, National Science Foundation, that's Palmer Station, and a Ukrainian station, Vernotsky, where I bought my t-shirt. And we'll visit uh, Port Lacroix, which is now a museum and the southernmost post office in the world. So the expedition, uh, this was a two week expedition. I traveled with Travel Dynamics International. But the trip was originally arranged by Bet Chart Expeditions, which I mentioned earlier um, <clears throat> at other presentations. They tend to arrange um, trips uh, of a scientific interest for scientists, scientific groups, and so forth. And we're going to be looking briefly at Ushuaia and going into Tierra del Fuego National Park. So flying down to Buenos Aires, it was at night, I didn't get any pictures, but uh, the next day as we left Buenos Aires flying south, um, for about an hour, I could look down, this was all I saw. Uh, farmland laid down in a jigsaw pattern like this, and it persisted like this until we reached the coast. And then um, once we left the coast, we were over open waters until we were down near Ushuaia and descending to land. So uh, over land here, you see mountains. And as we get lower, you see them in a little more detail. It's December, but down in the Southern Hemisphere, that's now summer. So there's not a lot of snow left up in the mountains. And then we land. So here we are at the airport, looking out my window. Uh, this is a view from across the Beagle Channel, looking at Ushuaia. Again, about 57,000 population. And another view of part of Ushuaia. And I'll just point out up here on the hill, more or less by itself, this is the hotel we stayed in for the two or three nights uh, that we were there before departure. So the Beagle Channel is about 150 miles in length. This is an aerial view looking towards the east and a wide angle view looking south towards the islands on the other side. But now back at the airport, we're in a bus. Bus picks up our group and drives us through Ushuaia. And I just uh, took a quick picture. It's almost Christmas time, so here's a Billboard uh, advertising Papa Noel, Father Christmas. And you can look at the streets, it's been it's damp, it's been raining there since before we arrived. And looking up the hill, this is the hotel we're going to. 
I had a room next to the top, sort of in this vicinity here. And looking out my window, I get a very nice view of the Beagle Channel. I took a few pictures looking different directions of the Beagle Channel. And then the next day, um, we're heading west on Highway 3, and we're going to uh, the National Park of Tierra del Fuego, just a seven-mile drive. And welcome to the park. And here we are, uh, again, looking at the Beagle Channel, looking south at the islands and mountains down there. And it's a pretty breezy day, as you can see from the flags. And here in the park, we have a post office. It says, uh, end of the world. Uh, it's not quite the end of the world. We can go uh, considerably further to the south. But um, you can get your, take care of your passports and all kinds of things right at this station. And we walked around for a couple hours in the park looking at the sites. So pretty much everybody you see here is in our group. A uh, couple of native birds that we see looking out the bus window. And this was one of the members of our group and he's standing by the sign, uh, National Park Tierra del Fuego. And it announces the end of route number three. Pan American Highway. And if you want to go to Buenos Aires, it's about uh, 3,000, about 2,000 kilometers, I'm sorry, 2,000 miles to the north. If you want to go to Alaska, it's almost 18,000 kilometers, more than 10,000 miles to the north. And as indicated on the map, here is Route 3. And here is where it ends, and that is where that sign was located at the end. One final view looking to the west along the Beagle Channel. And now we are in Ushuaia and we have a couple hours to walk around and explore the city. It is certainly set up for tourists, uh, cafe and bar, a lot of places to eat. A restaurant here. An Irish pub, beer, fast food. This is a government building. Um, Ushuaia is the capital of Tierra del Fuego. Uh, governing takes place in this building. And now we're gonna walk down to the harbor. I say walk down, this is a pretty hilly area that we're in. And these people at the rail are just looking out over the harbor. And what they see is this. And there are three cruise ships, fairly large. This one, this one, and then the biggest one over here. Our boat, the Corinthian, is the smallest of the three. It is this boat. And the one in front of us is a National Geographic Explorer. So this is our boat the Corinthian, another picture of the Corinthian taken at another time, another location. This boat is um, about 290 feet in length, cruises at about um, 16, 17 knots, uh, 18, 19 miles an hour. It'll take about a day and a half to cruise the 700 miles that we have to go from Ushuaia down to the Antarctic Peninsula. There are 49 cabins, they all face outwards. Um, two persons per cabin, it's equipped to handle 98 passengers. And one more view. Um, this ship has some history and on one occasion got grounded, ran aground down in the Atlantic, I'm sorry, Antarctic Peninsula, had to be uh, pulled off with other boats. In the following year, uh, while crossing the Drake Passage, it was hit by a rogue wave, which uh, damaged it considerably. Uh, 
pretty much took out the bridge, which is up here, which you can see is quite some distance above the water level. And it was, um, it was assisted by um, the National Geographic Explorer uh, with that difficulty. So here we are, uh, ready to board. This uh, lady over here is going up the gangplank. And it's now our turn to go up the gangplank. And as soon as we are inside, we are met by these charming ladies and gentlemen uh, to welcome us aboard and to give us our uh, complimentary glass of champagne. The cabins are very nice. In fact, each cabin is a multi-room suite. And this is um, what my room looks like. Uh, here I am taking a picture of myself taking a picture and uh, here's my glass of champagne sitting here. And in front of us, uh, again, the National Geographic Explorer. It left and we left Ushuaia approximately the same time, although we, we left a little bit ahead of uh, the National Geographic. So here we are leaving the dock, pulling away from the dock, leaving the dock behind and looking back at Ushuaia, part of the city, and just at the edge of the picture, here's our hotel up here on the hill. So the back deck has a number of tables set up where one can um, have lunch or a snack or a meal. The temperatures aren't too cold. Here is the tugboat that helped us to uh, get away from the dock safely. And shortly after the boat's underway, we do a practice. We, we have to gather at our muster station. So this is muster station A. The muster station is where you go uh, when there's an emergency, like the boat is sinking, and you need to get on the lifeboat. So we have to practice that. So you see we're all wearing our life jackets, and uh, hopefully everybody has gone to his or her proper muster station and we're showing how we'll get on the lifeboats and so forth. And finally, we're out in the, the open waters and on our way south. And as we're getting down to dusk and the sun is setting, we can still see some remaining islands just uh, south, just south of um, Ushuaia and the, the islands which are down here at the tip of South America. And the next day, um, we're underway. Waters are quite smooth, uh, disappointingly so. And we always have birds that follow us, just a couple of them, or birds. Picture was taken another time, but here's an albatross, which are common in the area. A little more uh, surf here. And as we get further south, it gets cooler little moisture in the air and we start to uh, grow some icicles. This small icicle that you see here. And we see our first iceberg finally over here. Zooming in on the iceberg. This is our iceberg. And here's a young fellow pointing at the first iceberg he's ever seen. Uh, on the right we have one of the crew members this young boy had an interesting story. He'd been in the hospital for weeks. He had been very sick. And his grandmother promised him that once he was recovered and out of the hospital and ready to travel, she would take him anywhere in the world he wanted to go. So he and his grandmother were traveling together and he voted to go to Antarctica. because He's excited to see his first iceberg. This is, I think, a giant petrel flying overhead. And then eventually we begin to see sand, uh, sorry, we begin to see land down here after we've uh, crossed the Drake Passage. Well, this shows uh, our exact route that was taken back in 2013, December 19 through 29, 11 days on our ship. And this is our exact route indicated here in red. Because the water was so smooth, we made very good time. We had enough extra time, we could stop at Penguin Island. A great place to see penguins. It was not originally on the schedule, but with more time, 
you stopped at Penguin Island. Afterwards, we're going to go into the Weddell Sea. See if we can see any big icebergs. I'm going to stop here, and then we're going to travel south, stop at a variety of places, I'm going to work our way down to Vernadsky Station, where I bought my T-shirt, back up to Palmer Station, the U.S. Research Station. Port Lockroy is here. And then heading back north, we're going to stop at Eception Island, two stops, Telephone Bay and Whalers Bay. And the last stop in this area will be on Livingston Island at Walker Bay. Of course, we'll do some walking. So Penguin Island, volcanic island is what it looks like. So we get out the inflatable dinghies, uh, an Orion inflatable boat. These are going to be taking us all to shore. So this is the first boat going to shore. This is taking crew members, which will help the rest of us <coughs> uh, get, get off the boat once we're at the shore. So here comes on one boat to shore. And uh, she looks pretty excited, but uh, she, this person looks a little worried. And here we are getting ashore. So this is our, the main expedition leader right here. And he's standing in water. We're all wearing insulated rubber boots that's come up almost to our knees. So we can get out in shallow water with no problem and keep our feet dry. So uh, we're ready to get out. This person still looks pretty worried. And it's rocky. It's, it's a little tricky getting out because it's not a smooth sandy bottom. It's uh, rocks uh, that you have to, to walk over, being careful not to slip and fall down. You don't have too many people on land yet, but if you look carefully over here, you can see our first penguin. Not a very good view, but there's our first penguin. We're going to be seeing a lot more, a lot closer. So this part of the peninsula, there are three main types of penguins, which we'll be seeing. There is the Adelie penguin, which looks like a gentleman dressed up in his tuxedo. You can tell the penguin types by looking at their heads. This is an Adelie. This is the Gentoo penguin. And you'll notice they have orange bills or beaks. Also a white patch on the head above the eye. And the third variety that we saw most commonly is the chin strap penguin. You can probably guess where they got that name. So on shore, we quickly see more penguins. Let's see, here's a gentoo, here's a chin strap, another chin strap. And up in the snow a bit, uh, lots more penguins. Here's the chin strap penguin. They have no fear of uh, people because they are protected. We have certain rules we must follow. We're not allowed to get closer than about eight or 10 feet. We cannot approach them. If they want to uh, come up and see us closely because they're curious, that's allowed. But um, we cannot approach them. We have to stay back a certain distance. And they're kind of awkward on land. They don't move very fast. But since they have no fear of us, they just take their time and amble on past. Here is a deli penguin in his uh, tuxedo. And whoops, this is not a penguin. This, this is a seal. All the seals I saw down there do not look like they are underfed. They all look like they are well fed, including this guy. This is a petrol flying overhead. And we have a little snow coming down here for a moment. Uh, our expedition leader decides that we've been on the boat too long just sitting and eating. So we need to get a little more exercise. So he's going to take us on a hike up to look at the crater. So away we go. Following our leader. This is me back here with my tall hat. And we make it up to the crater. Have a look inside the crater. A little more snow coming down at the moment. 
And then we um, hike back to our boat. Back on board, the Corinthian. We're now going to head to the Weddell Sea looking for some big icebergs if we can find them. And as we're on the way, we certainly find lots of small icebergs. And as you probably know, icebergs very commonly are a little blue in color, as you see here. And this big rock is sort of the entrance into the Weddell Sea. So what we're looking for are what are called tabular icebergs. These break off from the ice sheets. They're flat on top. They have fairly vertical sides. So here is one. Here's the second one. Here's the third one over here. The rest of the ice is just sea ice, frozen seawater. But the tabular icebergs look like you see here. They say they can get very big. And once we're in, and sure enough, here is one of them. And it's pretty big, thousands of feet in length. We can get pretty close to them because the sides are vertical, uh, both above the water and below the water. So there's not too much worry about hitting ice um, before you get up close to the surface part because they go more or less straight up and down. These can be up to 2,000 feet in height. That's from the bottom to the top of the iceberg. And some of them are miles in size. The biggest one that broke off uh, a few years ago was something like 100 miles by 30 miles, one single iceberg from one of the ice shelves. OK, we're going to go back on land and look at more penguins. Uh, you may see in the picture a few streaks, which are going down this way. These are called penguin highways. And they're the routes taken by the penguins from the nesting area, which is up here on the rocks. They can't have their nests down further in the snow where it's too cold. They need them up here in the rocks where it's uh, warmer. But if they're up in the rocks and they need to eat, well, there's no food up there. They've got to go down and back into the water again to uh, find something to eat. So they make these uh, trails called high penguin highways. One of the rules is we are not allowed to step into the penguin highways. They are for penguins only. So we got the Orion um, inflatable boats out again. And we're heading to shore here. Lots of penguins. Here's a few on a floating iceberg. And now we got a few people on shore. So you see all the penguins which are here and the penguin highways you can see quite nicely here. And then up here we have literally thousands of penguin nests up here on the rocks, the warmer area for the penguins. Here's uh, another group of people coming in. Here's our lookout penguin. And here's another seal. Uh, here's another Adelie penguin. So looking down, we can see where all these nests are. And there are literally hundreds and hundreds of them. And up a little bit closer, we see a few of them. They make nests just out of rocks. Uh, they get pebbles and scoop them together. There aren't very many small pebbles, so they frequently are stealing them from each other. That's how they make a nest. Here's an Adeli, and here's a small uh, penguin chick being sat on, it looks like. A couple of Adeli penguins marching along. Back on the boat, we head further south. And as we go south, uh, we begin to see more and more snow, ice, more and more icebergs. So I'm now starting to see why so many uh, people that I talked to in the Galapagos Islands like the scenery they saw down there. There's not a lot of, there's not a wide variety of color, but I, I think the scenery is quite spectacular. Anywhere I looked, I thought the view was spectacular. I literally took 
many, many hundred thousands of pictures. So here's the sun going down uh, on another day. Next morning, uh, out again among the ice and snow. Okay, we are leaving our ship again, going ashore once more. So uh, helping her into the boat. And here comes a boat back to one of the islands. They're back to, I think now we're on the main part of the peninsula. Another penguin. And our, our leader decides that we need more exercise. We better do some more climbing. We're gonna climb up for a nice view looking out over the surrounding area. And on the way, uh, here we got, here's some um, Gen 2 penguins, penguin egg. And our leader takes us up, up and up. So up we go for a view, some good exercise. And up here at the top, as far as we're going, we can look back, here's our boat. We've climbed several hundred feet to get up to this point. Looking back at our boat, um, these little dark specks you see here are not penguins, these are people down here. These are the lazy people who were um, too lazy to um, climb up to this viewpoint. And coming down, there, there's a quicker way getting down. You can make a people or a human highway just like so and slide down. And it looks like it could be fun. At least some people think it's fun. And here's an imitation penguin. Delhi penguin. I'm sorry, Gentoo, Gentoo penguin. And this bad bird, bad bird as far as the penguins are concerned. This is a skua. And they like to eat penguin eggs and they like to eat young penguin chicks. So here's a penguin on a nest, a skua, skua nearby, just looking for an opportunity to jump in and steal an egg or steal a young penguin if possible. Okay, heading back to the boat, but we're going to take a, not going directly back, we're going to take a circuitous route among some of these smaller icebergs just to check them out. Here's an iceberg with some icicles hanging down. Another iceberg with icicles. And then we're going to leave the area. And so we're looking back where we had been and we're trying to clear the water of ice as we move through it. There's no vegetation that grows down there, but um, there are little patches of lichen, which you, you can see here, which are growing on the rocks. Nothing green. Sometimes it's nice to have the contrast between areas illuminated by the sun and others which are um, not. And we have reached the southernmost point of our trip. This is Vernadsky Station, Ukrainian Station, 260 miles, to, sorry, 260 meters to the right. So we're going to land here, and this is our expedition leader who's going to help us get ashore safely. And once ashore, uh, welcome to Vernadsky. And the three languages I can read, bonjour. Guten Tag and hello. So we're welcome. 
So this is, again, Ukrainian research station. It was originally uh, operated by the British. And it was uh, operated by the British for 49 years. And it was sold in 1996 to the Ukrainians for a cost of one pound, one pound sterling. Uh, if, they if the British abandoned the base, then they'd have to spend a lot of money um, restoring it to the natural condition, taking everything away. It was much easier and cheaper just to sell it to someone. The Ukrainians bought it and have got a pretty vigorous research uh, effort going on at this location. So here's a signpost telling us, showing us directions and distances. Kiev, 15,000 um, kilometers. McMurdo Sound, Sydney, Australia, and a variety of other places. Uh, inside the research lab, I wasn't able to read this, but um, they also show us in English. This is the room where they study magnetism, geomagnetism. And here we encountered the southernmost souvenir shop on the earth. This is where my t-shirt came from. So they got a variety of things you can buy, little statues of penguins and other things, t-shirts. And if you like a little snack, uh, these people will sell you things or they will sell you things. So a couple little things to snack on. Uh, when I was there, for $3 a shot, they would sell you a glass of, and it is called uh, Horilka, Horilka. Alcoholic beverage, which they brew right there in their station, made from fermented grains. It's distilled. It goes up to about 40% alcohol. Too strong for me, so I didn't uh, get any of that. Um, <clears throat> fuel oil in this container. Then we go for a little hike. In fact, we're going to hike to another island, nearby island, not too difficult because the seawater is frozen. We're just going to walk on the ice, sea ice. And we're going over to this house right here. This is Wordy House. This was the original British base. And Wordy House is also now registered as <clears throat> historic site and monument number 62. Um, it was built in 1935. It was destroyed in 1946 by a tsunami, and then it was rebuilt later. And some of the artifact, original artifacts, <clears throat> can be seen inside Wordy House. Back on the boat. Time for a meal. And since it's a nice, reasonably warm day and there's no wind blowing, we're going to eat out on the deck. So here's a carving station, got a variety of different sauces here. Um, buffet style, you take whatever you want, as much as you want. Mixed vegetables, some sausages, pasta, sauce, looks like maybe fish and rice. Salad items, uh, fresh fruit, got a watermelon, pineapple, apples, pears, oranges. Uh, to the two research stations that we visited, we took them fresh uh, fruit and vegetables and they were delighted. They think they've been eating uh, canned stuff for quite a few months. They were pretty much their first visitors they'd had. Uh, pastries. So eating out on the deck at the tables. Sun is shining, you can see um, shadows there. And it's sitting in the sun with no wind, it's uh, reasonably warm. People are wearing life jackets, but nobody's wearing a parka pretty much. And the scenery, the scenery is spectacular. How would you like to have that scenery every day for lunch? A uh, glacier uh, coming down to the sea and breaking up. A 
Without wind, um, the water can be very still, making a very nice mirror, reflecting. These are mountains. They look like mountains. They are mountains. They are a continuation of the Andes Mountains uh, from South America. They persist all the way into Antarctica. Across the Drake Passage, they're underwater, but they're still down there. And now they're up uh, above the surface of the water again. We were a little worried that there's uh, some snow up here. It looked like it could come down sooner or later, producing an avalanche. This is a close view of the area. Uh, fortunately, no avalanches as we uh, cruise past. So now we're going to go in the gap between these two mountains right here. So here's the gap we're going to sail in. And I'm thinking now about the occasion where this boat ran aground in the past down in this area. Here's the gap we're moving through. And once we're on the other side, uh, more mountains, snow and ice. Sun is setting in another day. And behind us, we can see that uh, light of the setting sun reflected from the snow. Okay, so next we are going to visit uh, Anvers Island, located right here. We are going north now, heading back. At Anvers Island, we're going to visit Palmer Station, National Science Foundation Research Station, located right here on the island. Vernotsky, which we had visited earlier, is down here. Palmer Station. So this is what it looks like as we approach it uh, in our boat. This is uh, somewhat of an aerial view of what it looks like. A uh, variety of buildings. Uh, either fuel tanks over here, and on this fuel tank, there's something painted. We'll get a better look at that in a minute. But first, uh, we're welcomed by these young ladies. Palmer Station, National Science Foundation, established in 1965. So this is one of the scientists who works there. And she gives us a tour of the area. And uh, we bring fresh fruits and vegetables. And we're very popular. We're very happy to receive them. And in their enthusiasm, they have baked a huge tray of brownies for us, which we enjoyed. They also have their uh, signpost pointing the direction and distances. South Pole is still. 1,744 miles away. Punta Arenas is 837 miles and so forth. Here's our boat out here waiting for us. So one of the people in our group and here's that fuel tank, Palmer Station, Antarctica, little painting on the side. Uh, one of the research tools they use there, they do a lot of marine biology, is this device called a Slocum electric glider. These are quite amazing. Um, they have an internal chamber into which one can pump seawater or evacuate the seawater. When the seawater is inside, they're a little more dense than the surrounding water and they sink. And when they've gone as far down as one wants to go, they can pump that water out of the chamber, their density drops and they rise to the surface. So you, they, they go up and down, up and down but with the wings, while they're going either up or down, they're also moving forward at the same time. They sort of trace out a, a sawtooth pattern underwater. These things can travel on their own for months at a time. They can travel a thousand miles or more. They can be pre-programmed as to where to go. They can be up to 40 different types of sensors put on them. So they, they carry out a lot of measurements. Uh, all by themselves. Just have to pre-program them. So here's one just uh, starting a dive from the surface. Okay, so we were finished with our visit of Palmer, Palmer Station, heading back to the boat. So 
beautiful bird pictures. And I come down to check the dining room. I'm the first one there. This guy is just delighted to see me. And it looks like we're gonna be eating again. And so lots of good food. Uh, looks like we have some soup, uh, bread and crackers and cheese and butter, uh, salad fixings. Uh, well, I, we, got, we got some shrimp over here. We ate well on board the boat. Fish and rice, I think. Fish and rice. Potatoes and some burgers of some sort. Pasta and a sauce. Carving station, big turkey. Uh, again, fresh fruit, pastries, more pastries. This is a special day. So there's one special pastry that we all get a piece of. And this is our Christmas cake because this is Christmas day. Christmas day down in Antarctica. Okay, continuing uh, further north, we stop at uh, Port Lockroy. This was a former British uh, research area. It was a research area from 1944 to 1962. And in 1966, it was converted into a museum and a post office. So here's the main museum building right here. So we're gonna go ashore, people waiting for us. And this is a welcome, this is Antarctic Treaty Historic Site number 61, British base, Port Lockroy. Couple members of our group, British flag. And we're gonna go inside the museum. Uh, you can see a lot of penguins nesting here. They perfectly happy with people around because people never bother them. And inside the museum, we see some of the type of food they ate back in the old days when they didn't have fresh food. Quaker oats uh, with Smedley's peas, a variety of prepared and dried vegetables and fruit, a bunch of meats, marmite, looks like black axle grease, uh, pork sausages, brisket beef, uh, what's this, a steak and kidney pudding, butter, like refined, pure refined lard. I think the food we had on, boat, on our boat was much better. And they, they have a recipe book here, how to, how to fix things. For example, you can make faggots by mixing seal liver with onions and um, bacon. <laughs> Bread, what really caught my eye was seal brains. As it says, this part of the seal I would consider one of the delicacies and luxuries of the Antarctic and was extremely enjoyed by most members of the base at which I was a chef. Like all brains for cooking purposes, seal brains must be good and fresh and in whatever manner they are served, they must first be blanched and prepared as follows. First, Make sure that the brains are free from clots of blood. If they are saturated with blood, then throw them away as they are, as a, are of no use. They must be of a whitish silky color, apart from the veins and the nerves that are visible in the outer covering, etc. cetera. Well, after reading that, I decided I was never gonna try seal brains. Back outside, uh, some more penguins and imitation penguins. And of course, well-fed seals. So we're walking around a little bit, enjoying the scenery back on the boat. Continue by heading north. Next day, we encounter some whales. Here's one spouting, getting a breath of fresh air. So where we're heading next is Deception Island. And um, 
It's up here in the South Shetland Islands again, though it's indicated here in red. It's called Deception Island because from almost all directions, it looks just like a normal island. Only from one particular direction, you can see it's, it's a ring, not a complete island. Um, it in fact is a volcanic caldera and it's considered active. Um, back in 1967 and 69, it erupted and caused damage to two different research stations, one operated by the Argentinians and one operated by the Spanish. So, um, to get into the interior known as Port Foster, one has to go through this narrow opening called Neptune's Bellows. It is named Neptune's Bellows because of strong wind gusts that are encountered there from time to time. So we're going in, we're going over to Teflon Bay. We're gonna get out and hike around a bit or exercise. And then we're going back to Whalers Bay. We're gonna look at an old whaling station. So here we are approaching Deception Island. And this is the entrance, go into the interior. We're passing through Neptune, Neptune's bellows here. Not a windy day, pretty smooth and calm. Looking across to the opposite side, we're going over here, get out and hike. So this is the region we're going to be landing. And here we are landing. So Here's some crew on shore and one of the first boats going in, carrying passengers. Here I've just turned around and looked back towards Neptune Bellow. This is the region we came in to this area, right here. We're now on shore and um, gonna go for a hike. Gonna go up and look at another crater. So here we are, craters off to our left. So that's about as far as we can go in this direction. See, it looks very black. It looks almost like coal. But this is not coal. This is a volcanic rock. And so uh, we're going to turn around and head back. You can see our boat out here in the distance. So this is the region of the crater here. We're not going back the route we took. We're gonna to go up this way, up this ridge, then we're gonna hike back this way and then down to the boat. So to get up high on the ridge, we can look back and see a few stragglers back here. And here I am with my tall hat again. And now hiking uh, back down to the boat and make another people highway. Quick fun way down. He seems to be enjoying it. And the next stop is um, Whaler Station over here, Whaler's Bay. So this um, in 1912 was set up by the Norwegians as an on-land base to process whales, to get whale oil. And it persisted, they were in business till 1931 when they closed down because the price of whale oil um, dropped significantly. So this is where we're headed. And we're getting close to shore. We can see something, it looks like it's come out of the water and is wandering around. We're wondering what that is. This will answer your question, a penguin. Okay, on shore, the remains of this whaling station, Norwegian whaling station. Imagine the number of whales they had to kill to fill these with whale oil. This guy looks a little crazy. He's out here in a swimming suit running around in the water with snow all around. In fact, he's not alone. Uh, turns out there's still some residual heat from the last eruption, which was back in August of uh, 1970. Still some residual heat, so this water is a little warmish, not very, but a little warmish enough that uh, some people taking a chance and getting into it. 
He doesn't think it's uh, particularly warm, I don't think. This is not our group. This is a photo I found somewhere else of another group um, in this Luke cool water. Okay, and this is our last stop. We're going to Walker Bay on Livingston Island. And again, you can see a lot of penguins here. Here's another chin strap penguin. And we're going out for a walk around. We're not gonna go do much climbing here. Just walk around more or less on the level. And lo and behold, I come, I come across some fossils. So although nothing green grows there now, it's clear that sometime in the past, these looked like ferns uh, grew in this area. And of course, some more well-fed seals. So I saluted this sail and lo and behold, he saluted back. And here's a couple of elephant seals having a discussion with each other. And now we're back on the boat and we are heading north. Sun goes down. And this is the land that we see at the Shetland Islands. So about a day and a half later, we're approaching South America and this is our first glimpse, which you can see up here. This is Cape Horn, Cape Horn, southern tip of South America. So we're, in our, we're out of Argentina and we're in Chilean water. So we have to radio ahead and get permission to come here and get up close to Cape Horn. And this again is a National Geographic Explorer, which was just ahead of us on its return trip. So a little map showing you where we are. Uh, Cape Horn, for many years, I thought Cape Horn uh, was, uh, part of, was just on the mainland, southern tip. That's not true, it's on an island. Uh, there's a cluster of islands here south of the mainland, and Cape Horn is right here, the southern part of uh, Hornos Island. This is the northern uh, part of the channel beneath us, and um, this is the dividing point between the Atlantic Ocean on the left and the Pacific Ocean on the right. So we go just uh, to the right uh, a little bit, I'm sorry, to the left. We go, we go to the west a little bit into the Pacific so we can say we've been there, looking a little bit north, turn around, head east again. And uh, this is part of Hornos Island again, a little something up here. And a little bit closer, you can see some detail. So this is a monument, this is a memorial and together, it, they are a memorial to the thousands of sailors who lost their lives passing through this area uh, over the centuries. Uh, this is the flying albatross you see here, about 22. Memorial monument over here. So now we're leaving. Um, Cape Horn behind. This is an aerial view of what part of the island looks like. And this is the end of our tour. So these were our tour guides. While we were crossing the water with nothing to see, they would give us uh, lectures, seminars, so with lots of information. This was our chief guy who led us when we were on land and got us there and back safely. And that is the end of my presentation. So I thank you very much for your attention. That wasn't quite incredible. That was a lot of penguins. <laughs> yeah, well, it was a lot of penguins. I didn't, <laughs> I can't verify there were millions, but- uh, Quite a few. <laughs> oh, well, it had to be close to millions. Well, I'll start with the question. Someone asked, they said, I've never thought about it, but do you have to go through customs when you get to Antarctica? 
Um, we went through customs, certainly to get into Argentina. That was, uh, that was probably the customs that we went through, maybe going through customs coming back. Um, someone else asked, was the weather in Antarctica about this <coughs> here? Oh, it was warmer than here, or well, warmer than here has been. Yeah, it's been quite cold uh, a, few, a few days ago. <clears throat> it was typically above freezing while we were there, probably, probably in the upper 30s, something like that. And we saw, saw uh, when they were eating out on the deck. With no wind setting in the sun, it was it was quite warm, just like jackets was all that was required. So I'd say in the upper 30s, maybe even lower 40s at times. Very different than the South Pole. I was there, it was 30 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Someone asked, when was the boat you mentioned being hit by the rogue wave? When was it hit by the wave and where was it hit? Um, it was it was hit crossing the Drake Passage, and was hit back in, did I write it down, 19, 1970, I believe, no. I, let me look at my notes, I'll give you a definite answer. It was hit uh, back in, it was launched in 1990, and it was uh, disabled by the rogue wave in the Drake Passage um, in the year, in December of 2010. And it, it, it uh, did a lot of damage to the bridge, which was, I don't know, probably 30 feet above, 30, 40 feet above the water. Yikes. <laughs> um, so, 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 so I was looking forward to seas like that because I'd never, <laughs> in seas like that, and I thought that'd be pretty exciting. You had calm. You had calm seas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, unusually calm. It was one of the calmest crossings they'd ever had. Um, someone asked. I want to know how did you choose your cruise line from among all the options? And well, it was it was Bet Chart Expeditions, and I checked with them with them regularly because they arranged tours for scientists, scientific groups, and so forth. So they were the ones who announced the tour. Now, what I can tell you is that the Corinthian isn't always down in the Antarctic. It also, um, at other times of the year, it's up in the Mediterranean. It even comes into the Great Lakes and um, goes to Mackinac Island, up into uh, Lake Superior. So if you check on its schedule, you might be able to get a ride on it without having to travel very far. <laughs> what, well, um, it was sort of the price range for the total expedition, someone asked. Oh, um, gosh, that was a while back. Um, thousands of dollars, certainly. Um, it was a lot cheaper than going to the South Pole, which was more like $60,000. Um, it was more like, 25,000. So I'm guessing this was probably 15, 15,000 in that ballpark, I'm guessing. That, that was back in um, 2013, 2013, so maybe a few years ago. And someone else asked, is it a kind of trip anyone can take or do you have to be a scientist? No, anybody can go. Yeah, they're happy to take your money. <laughs> and it was well worth it. I, I, I'm really glad I got the recommendation like that. I'm glad I went. So you, you showed a few different um, varieties of penguins. Someone asked, do they hang out together? Will you find these penguins together or are they sort of territorial? Um, no, I don't think they're territorial. I certainly see you see mixed uh, species like in the nesting areas. You'll see different species uh, side by side. And uh, so I wouldn't say, yeah, they don't, they just, um, they're just there. They're not in big groups by themselves. Um, they have to mix with other species. 
Um, sort of, sort of in the earlier portion, you showed some big chunks of ice. Someone asked did that, so that broke off from the sea shelf. Yes, yes, the ice shelves, right? Yeah, now the, the tabular icebergs, which are flat on top, have pretty much vertical sides. They're, they're from the the uh, sea shelves, where, where you can have many, many hundreds of square miles of ice. Your pieces break off and float away. They can be very large, it can be miles in dimensions and up to 2,000 feet in thickness. Is there, a, in your opinion, a best time of the year to, to visit this area? Well, I went in December, which was their, their summer. Um, the um, at, at Vernonsky Station, no, not Vernonsky Station, at uh, uh, Port Lockroy. They're only open five months out of the year. Uh, and, and in the wintertime, when it gets really cold and things are frozen over, then you, you can't go there. Uh, the, the five warmest months of the year is when you can go. I'm not sure if I mentioned that uh, they, they typically had something like 18,000 visitors there in, in a five month period. And that was the southernmost post, official post office in the world to handle something like uh, 70,000 pieces of mail out of there in that five month period. Do you, uh, of the penguins you saw, someone asked, what is the biggest, which one's the biggest in size? Well, the um, penguins, I think are a little bit taller than the Gentoo penguins, the same size of, of the chin straps. And I think they, what are they, 16, 16, 18, 18 inches high. We didn't have any of the bigger emperor penguins in that part of Antarctica. So 16, 18 inches in height. And they like people. They're often curious and will come up and, and have a good close look at you. Um, do you know if there's, is there any impact of the tour boats on the icebergs and the wildlife, someone asked? Uh, it's not supposed to be. There is a treaty which is set up among a variety of countries around the world to preserve that area for scientific research and to have as little effect on it as possible. So there are very strict rules which we have to follow. For example, we're not, we're not supposed to be tracking anything in that we might bring with us. So there was a strong disinfectant that we had to wade through to get out to uh, our dinghies. And then when we come back on the boat, we wade through that again. Uh, we're, we're supposed to leave, have as little impact as possible. And I, I think they're doing quite well in, in, in following those uh, requirements. Do you know, uh, are there other animals besides the penguins and the seals that live? Penguins and seals, birds, lots of birds. birds. Polar bears, polar bears at the other end of the, of the earth. Um, penguins and birds and seals, that, that's what we saw. And someone asked, are imitation penguins actually penguins? No, no, uh, they're, they're some type of bird. The penguins don't fly. These, they look a bit like penguins, but they got long necks and wings, which will allow them to fly, but I don't know what they are. Um, I was going to look it up, but I didn't have time. That's fine. Um, I agree, they look quite a bit like penguins, but they're not exactly penguins. Someone was wondering what a what a whaling station is. Uh, that's where they were uh, catching, killing whales and harvesting them for primarily for whale oil. And so by, in the early 1900s, there was a lot of that going on down there. They started in the deception island area around 1905. 1912, this Norwegian company set, set an operation up on land. And then, as I said, in 1931, they shut down primarily because there was a glut of oil, whale oil. Prices dropped. How long was this trip in duration? Uh, from Detroit down and back was uh, two weeks, 14 days. And we were on the boat 11 days. 
uh, was the weather in Argentina similar to here in summer, someone asked? Well, we're, we're in a pretty low uh, south latitude. It was cool. We were walking around in the park, uh, Tierra del Fuego Park. We had our jackets on and uh, it wasn't cold. I wouldn't call it cold, I would call it cool. If you had to choose one thing from this trip, what was the most exciting? What? Well, just being there and say, probably just being there and seeing the scenery. But the scenery was spectacular. I, I, I took hundred. I think I took thousand, probably a couple thousand pictures. But no matter where I was or what direction I was looking in, I thought that would be a great picture. So I took another one. So what I've showed you just now is probably the order of 10, 15 percent of the pictures I took. Just <laughs> a mere sampling. What was uh, the device with sensors that was used underwater called? The device? Oh, 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 the Slocum electric glider. Yeah, that, that was used by the marine biologists to uh, study the oceans down there. Um, you can buy them if, if you like them. You can buy one for yourself for about $100,000. You can pre-program and just let them go. And they can be on their own for months at a time. They will follow a prescribed course. They go up and down, up and down to the depth that you want, back to the surface. They can extend an antenna at the surface and radio their findings to a satellite, which will relay them down to you, the scientist who is using them. Uh, there's 40 different kinds of sensors. They can measure uh, salinity of the water. They can measure uh, the temperature of the water, uh, a bunch of other things that oceanographers might want to know, 40 different properties they can measure, and then uh, they just do it all on their own once they're programmed. It's called the Slocum Electric Glider. Do you know how far down they can go? Yeah, about, they can go down a thousand feet below the surface. There's just a couple more questions. Someone asked that the local scientists there describe any historical changes um, because of global warming. Yes, yes, yes. That's something I could have mentioned. Uh, at the Ukrainian station, that had been uh, operated uh, by the British for 40 some years before they sold it to the Ukrainians. And the Ukrainians now have had it for quite a few years as well. So they've been taking temperature measurements there for many decades and they've been monitoring what the temperature has been doing. And what they've noticed is that the temperature has been rising there by about one degree Fahrenheit per decade. And has been doing that now for several decades. The last question I see is, do you happen to know the wingspan of an albatross? Yes, 10 feet. 10 feet, wow. Yes, yeah, so they get up to 10 feet. Wow. They, they got big wings. <laughs> They're, 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 they're excellent gliders. With the right breezes, they can glide for hours and hours and hours without flapping their wings once. I just remember from a book I had to read in English class, don't shoot one down because it's bad news. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You don't want to shoot the albatross. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. That was incredible. I'm just going to put up a poll now. So anyone who was here, um, we're gonna just ask you, you know, when would be the ideal time you would want the next talk? Um, you know, we would have to see Jerry's schedule too, but we wanna see your preference. And also we're gonna ask where you would like to go next. He has a few other uh, talks already waiting kind of in the wings. So I'm gonna put up a poll here. Um, all right, so it's anonymous, feel free to vote. <laughs> and on where, you, where and when you think we should go next on next journey with Jerry. So hard to compare with penguins. <laughs> the poll should be showing up on your screen if you can't see it. Steve, do you want to just um, read them the titles in case some people can't get the poll? Yeah. I add it to the chat. So they said, uh, where do we go next? 
here are the four options. The first one is double feature, the launch of LightSail 2 and a visit to the world's largest machine, the LHC. That's one. The second one is sailing and flying the Great Lakes. The third one is Chile, the driest place in the world, Chile in the Atacama Desert. And then the fourth is large and historic telescopes in the USA. Very good options. Let's give a few more seconds if anyone wants to make their final votes. I've had 88% of people have voted so far and I, I will also count those that came in the chat. All right, five more seconds, <laughs> four, three, two, one. All right, well, it was, it was overwhelmingly, uh, they want another one sooner rather than later in April. So we'll, we'll look at Jerry's schedule for April. Um, I didn't put March on there because the university has a spring break. Um, and then it looks like the winner of where to go next is Chile, the driest place in the world which will be a fun and exciting one. And I think even with the additional votes, that one still won. So uh, yeah, what, what can we expect from that one, Jerry? <laughs> well, we're gonna go down and visit the Atacama Desert, driest place in the world. There are places down there in the desert where it hasn't rained in more than a century. So that, that is getting pretty dry. We'll go down and we'll look at some of the uh, telescopes down in Chile, some of the Serving places in the world. And some of them are on the edge of the Atacama Desert. So we'll, we'll get a look at some telescopes and also the desert itself. Well, that sounds like an exciting one. I just got to share one comment. Some, Teresa said in the chat, Jerry has gotten us through COVID. We need his presence. <laughs> we all agree. So. Okay, great. Thanks again, yeah. Jerry, and uh, really appreciate it. And I will see everyone next time. Well, thank you so much. And uh, Thank you. <laughs> yep. Good night. Good night. Bye, everybody. Bye.